Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Today, we're joined by Dr. Andy Pavia, Chief of Division of Infectious Disease for the University of Utah and the Director of Hospital Epidemiology at Primary Children's Hospital. We're going to be talking about a recent illness that is making the rounds in the media having to do with COVID-19 specifically in children. This symptom is known as multiple system inflammatory syndrome. Dr. Pavia, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So let's start with the basics. Can you explain to us um, what multiple symptom inflammatory syndrome is so that people can understand that? So this is a syndrome that was really just recognized in the end of April. And it appears to be associated with coronavirus, with the uh, virus that causes COVID-19, but it's quite distinct from that. People noticed that they were seeing children who were coming in with four or five days of fever they would develop severe abdominal pain. Some of them would have red eyes, occasionally red lips, um, and then they would become very ill. They would develop low blood pressure or shock, and there would be signs of inflammation throughout the body, particularly involving particularly organs. What was striking about this was this is not what we normally see with coronavirus disease mm -hmm. in adults, where it's much more of a pneumonia. People have muscle aches and fever, but really the primary symptoms are uh, cough and shortness of breath. What's also more interesting, uh, what's, what's very different about this and extremely interesting, is this is, appears to happen quite a while after the initial infection in children. So I know there's been a, there's two different terms that have kind of been floating out there. There's the multiple system inflammatory syndrome and then um, Kawasaki syndrome or disease. What are the differences primarily between the two and why have they been kind of linked together in the media? Well, this is a new syndrome. It's not Kawasaki disease, but it looked a lot like Kawasaki's disease. And in some of the patients, it really has many, many of the features of Kawasaki disease, but in others, it does not. So when doctors first started to realize they were seeing an unusual pattern of illness in children, they really noticed how much it looked like Kawasaki disease. But there are a couple of really notable differences. Uh, this tends to occur in older children, uh, school age and, uh, and even teenagers, whereas Kawasaki's disease is typically in very young children. Um, there are differences in the pattern of disease involvement here as well. So in Kawasaki's disease, uh, when the heart is involved, it's the blood vessels, the arteries that feed the heart that are most often involved. Whereas that is seen occasionally in MISC, but more often it's the muscle of the heart that's involved. And there are a number of other differences in the laboratory testing that are quite distinct. But in some patients, they really look quite alike. So we're trying to tease that apart. And how uh, common is this condition? I know you said that it's, it's pretty new. It was discovered at the end of April. Uh, and why do you think it affects children more than others as well? Well, uh, the first question is one we can start to answer. Uh, we're just beginning as a research community, as, as uh, epidemiologists around the world, to collect cases and get numbers. So in the UK, where they're much farther along in their outbreak than uh, we are. They identified something like 47 cases across the country. In the US, um, the reports are just beginning to file in as the CDC has made this reportable disease, but there's something like 130 to 140 cases in the New York metropolitan area in New York State, and then um, maybe another, we don't know quite how many, another 40, 50 across the entire United States. That would make it very rare compared mm -hmm. to what's now um, a million cases of coronavirus infection in the US. But we're just collecting the information. So we hope it will remain a very, very rare disease, uh, but it may be a little bit more common than that. It may be just rare. Um, the second question you asked is, why are we seeing this particular picture in children and not in adults? And we have no idea. Children are very different in how they respond to this coronavirus than adults. They uh, very rarely get very bad pulmonary disease. They very rarely end up in the ICU. And in fact, they're much less likely to get hospitalized than adults. Uh, there have been very, very few deaths in children due to the primary infection, that is the effects of the virus itself. But now we're seeing this very unusual pattern that occurs 
as they are recovering from the disease, then as part of the immune response to it, which has not yet been recognized as clearly in adults. So why? It's because the immune systems are different in kids and they're not young adults, but that's a very facile answer. We really have to understand what it is about the immune response in kids that makes it so different. Do we have any indication on what's actually causing um, MISC? I know you mentioned that uh, there are certain symptoms related to it, but is there enough research or are we starting to figure out what we think is actually causing this? Well, we have a lot of ideas that are generated by some of the data we have. There are signs of immune activation. There are really dramatic amounts of immune activation in these kids, and it's in a somewhat unusual pattern. Uh, and there's some classic things about it that look a little bit like other diseases that are caused by an overactive immune syndrome. So there's resemblances to Kawasaki's disease. There's resemblance to something called macrophage activation syndrome, something called hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytic syndrome. Um, all of these diseases are caused by uh, overactivation of the immune system, sometimes uh, caused by or at least related to a genetic predisposition. So it appears that that's the direction that we're headed in understanding this. But to really be able to treat it optimally, we need to be able to say more than it's just an over response to the immune system because the immune system is incredibly complex. It's like saying it's an over uh, response of the defense department and we don't know whether it's an aircraft carrier in the Pacific or a marine detachment in Syria. Uh, so we're trying to figure out those details. And how right now are hospitals diagnosing MISC when children come in with this symptom? Um, now that the CDC has released some information, is it a little bit easier or is, it, is there a lot of stuff that goes on with actually diagnosing them? So with syndromes are collections of symptoms that make up uh, a disease process. And when you're first learning about one, you try and define it based on the patterns you're seeing. So CDC came out with a definition that we, and that's the royal we, all the uh, pediatric specialists around the country are using to identify probable and confirmed cases. And um, the thing about case definitions early on is that as you learn more, sometimes you learn that uh, there are other features that you didn't include in the case definition that you have to add, or that you made the case definition too broad, and you're actually including people who have something else. So this is gonna be an iterative process, where as we learn more, we refine it. Right now, what happens is that we uh, suspect it when we see a child who's had multiple days of high fever, who has marked signs of inflammation on their laboratory testing, and who has some of the other symptoms like bad abdominal pain, red eyes, red lips. And uh, then we look for evidence that they either have active infection with uh, SARS-CoV-2, with COVID, mm -hmm. or that they have signs that they have had a recent infection that they've rec recovered from because they have antibody. And when you put all those pieces together and you've excluded other causes, so you make sure that you that it isn't something like staph in the bloodstream, which can do many of the same things, uh, or toxic shock syndrome. And that's how you put together a probable case, and that's what we end up reporting. So when someone does come in with these symptoms, how do you typically treat them as well? So the treatment is evolving, and people have tried a number of different things. Because there are so many features that look like Kawasaki's disease, and because it can affect the heart and the coronary arteries, the um, treatment that's been used most commonly is to follow along the pathway of the treatment we use for Kawasaki's disease. It starts with intravenous immunoglobulin, often steroids are added, aspirin is used to prevent um, small blood clots from forming in the arteries. But not all of the patients have responded to that approach, and so sometimes other types of drugs which affect uh, the immune system and which block specific pathways of inflammation have been used. So right now, things have been tried that appear to work, but we really don't know what the optimal treatment is. And that's gonna be one of the big challenges over the next couple of months to years is to figure out not just what might work, but what really is the very best treatment.
It sounds very similar to COVID-19 that the, the treatment is ever evolving and we're still learning things and figuring things out. So if a parent notices these um, symptoms in their child, at what point should they contact their doctor? When does this become serious enough to actually require care? These are not children with very mild disease, so parents are going to be worried about kids who are headed down this pathway. Uh, typically, kids have had fever for four to five days by the time they're admitted. They often have severe abdominal pain to go along with that. And then they may see, the parents may see a rash that's relatively common, or red eyes, or red uh, cracked lips. So this is not something where your child's a little bit cranky and has a runny nose and you're going to wonder, do I wait it out? These are kids who are not getting better over the course of a couple of days and are starting to look pretty sick. So if you see that pattern of, of symptoms, bad abdominal pain, uh, multiple days of fever, uh, I think any sensible parent would figure that's time to bring your child in. You certainly can um, reach out to your pediatrician or your child care, uh, child health provider uh, over a video conference initially but probably if they're that sick, they're gonna to need to be seen, seen in person. Yeah, I think it's good to still mention that you can call your pediatrician and even if you want a second opinion um, before you do end up coming into the hospital, which brings me to my last question too. With everything that's going on right now, is it safe for me to bring my child into the hospital or clinic setting uh, in order to receive the care that they may need? That's one thing we've done very well over the last couple months is to figure out how to deliver care safely. So let's start with pediatricians offices. Most um, pediatricians have instituted uh, masking by all of their personnel. They have really robust cleaning practices. Many have separated the sick visit hours from uh, the routine child care. So they've made it possible for you to bring your child in for routine care, and that's really, really important. You know, mm -hmm. you really can't get behind on those well child checks and vaccines, otherwise you set up another set of risks for your kids. Um, and then each office has come up with a different way of handling sick visits. Many are doing a lot of phone and telehealth visits if the child seems sick enough. The same is true if you come into the hospital. We have uh, systems in place that will protect you from getting sick by virtue of coming to the hospital. It starts with screening the visitors and the accompanying parents for symptoms and fevers, putting a mask on everyone as they enter. All of the healthcare providers are wearing masks. So it, it is certainly reasonable to think we shouldn't be going to emergency departments and, and doctor's offices during a time when there's infectious diseases around, but we have done a lot of things to make it safe so that you can do it if you need to. And in the setting of the CMI, uh, the MISC that we've been talking about, you really are going to need to have your child evaluated. But don't forget the good old phone call. Pediatricians have, you know, for generations, uh, been willing to pick up the phone and talk to you and decide if they need to set up an in-person visit or a video visit. Yeah, I think that's really important to know hospitals are safe. We're doing everything we can to make sure that you feel safe and comfortable coming in. Um, and it might look a little different right now, uh, but the care is not different, which I think is really important. Um, Dr. Pavia, is there anything else that you wanted to mention to us about MISC um, or pediatric care right now? Well, I think MISC is really teaching us just how, how steep a learning curve this disease is. Everything about COVID-19 has been complicated. Every day, if not every, um, uh, every hour, we're learning something new about it. And MIC is probably just one of the most dramatic uh, wrinkles that we've seen in the pattern. The only thing I do want to say about pediatric care is that we are seeing evidence that kids are falling behind in their routine childhood care. And I really want parents to think about that um, it, it, if we end up having a measles outbreak on top mm -hmm. of COVID-19, it's going to be a disaster. And many of our younger kids are becoming vulnerable because they're falling behind on their vaccines. So if you come to the doctor's office, if you come to the hospital, you know, the crowded waiting rooms of, of your are gone. You will either be in a very 
well spaced out, very clean waiting room, or you may even wait in your car and get a text message to come in so there's no waiting room. So um, we really want people not to delay care, not to stay home and get sicker and sicker because they're worried about coming in. That's really great advice. I think that's a great note to end on. Dr. Pavia, thank you very much for joining us today. And if anyone still has questions about COVID-19 related symptoms and would like to get screened or tested, you can call our COVID-19 hotline at 844-442-5224, or you can visit intermountainhealthcare.org for all of our latest information about what's going on with COVID-19. Again, thank you so much for joining us and we'll see everyone next time. Thank you.